Hello, I'm Professor Brian Boucher, and welcome back. There's an old saying that there are only two certainties in life, death and taxes. The first one is beyond the scope of this course, but the second one is right in our wheelhouse. So we're going to spend this entire week talking about how taxes affect the financial statements. I can't wait. Let's get started. Let's start with a big overview slide of the differences between financial reporting and tax reporting. So on your financial statements, you come up with income tax expense, which is going to be based on the pre-tax income computed using either US GAAP or IFRS, whatever the accounting standards are in the country that you're located. So on your financial statements, and just as a note for these videos, if I talk about books or book income or book taxes, book stands for financial statements. It's a lot easier to say books a lot than financial statements, financial statements, financial statements. Okay. So anyway, on your books, you have the pre-tax income per GAAP or IFRS rules. You multiply that times something times the effective tax rate, and that's what's going to be the income tax expense on the income statement. Then in another set of books, you calculate income tax payable, or the tax that you pay in cash, based on taxable income using the tax code rules in whatever country you are. So for tax reporting, you use all of the, in the U.S., the IRS is the tax authority, so you would use IRS rules. If you're not in the U.S., then whatever country's tax rules are, um, those are what you would use to come up with something called taxable income, which is not going to be the same as pre-tax income. You take that times the statutory tax rate to get income tax payable. Income tax payable is what you actually owe the government in taxes, what you're going to have to pay them. Now, these two can be different, and as we're going to see, the differences can be due to what are called permanent differences or to temporary differences taxes. I thought this video was about Texas. I need to find my glasses. Do you think you can talk about Texas? This tax stuff sure looks boring. Well, people from Texas pay taxes. So as I'm talking about taxes, you can think about Texans paying taxes, and then you'll be thinking about Texas. So let's quickly look at some examples of how specific accounting policies differ between the financial statements and the tax return. And these are also things that we'll look at as examples we go throughout this week. So one example would be interest income from municipal bonds. So according to GAAP or IFRS, and I guess from now on, anytime I say GAAP, just also assume and IFRS because they're going to be the same on the things we look at. But anyway, on your financial statements, you get to book this as interest revenue, which increases your pre-tax income. As far as your tax code, this is tax exempt income. So it's not even going to show up at all on the tax return and it won't affect your taxable income. When you get cash advances from customers, so you get cash from customers before you deliver the goods or services, on your financial statements, we don't recognize revenue at that point. We only recognize revenue when it's earned, when you deliver the goods in this case. So that's going to happen in the future. So this won't affect your pre-tax income. But on the tax code, as soon as you collect the cash, the revenue is recognized. And so you get revenue today from the advance from customers, but you won't get revenue until the future on your financial statements, pre-tax income. Bad debt expense, as we saw earlier in the course, when you make a sale, you recognize bad debt expense during that period, an estimate of how many of those people won't pay you. But for the tax code, you don't get an expense until the accounts are actually written off sometime in the future, so it won't affect taxable income until down the road. And then finally, depreciation. As we've seen, companies can choose their own method of depreciation. They could do straight line or accelerated, although they almost all do straight line. But then they can choose salvage value, they can choose useful life. But for the tax code, the depreciation schedule is pretty much dictated by the tax authority. So we end up with different depreciation numbers on the financial statements and on the tax return. Y'all are being silly. Why are the rules so different? Are the tax accountants feuding with the financial accountants? Y'all just need to get along and make one set of rules. Yeah, a little known fact is the Hatfields were financial accountants and the McCoys were tax accountants. And so the great Hatfield and McCoy feud that's lived through history was really a tax accountant financial accounting battle at the start. So anyway, we need two sets of rules because there's two different objectives for these two sets of books. Tax accounting and tax rules is all about raising tax revenue for the government. It tries to do it in a fair and equitable manner 
Plus, it tries to provide incentives for companies to do certain kind of behavior, as we'll talk about a little bit later. Financial accounting, the goal is to provide useful information to external stakeholders like investors, creditors, customers, suppliers, employees. And it just turns out that those two goals are not easily reconcilable. So we have two sets of rules, and we just have to live with those two sets of rules. We're going to go through an extended example through the rest of the video to illustrate uh, how the mechanics of this works and to get down all the terminology. So in the example on the left side of the screen, or I guess the debit side of the screen, we're going to keep track of what's going on in the books or the financial statements. And on the right side of the screen, or, or the credit side of the screen, we're going to keep track of what's going on in the tax return. We're going to start in the example with EBITDA, which is defined as earnings before depreciation, municipal bond interest revenue, so that's the I, and taxes. And we're going to assume that in the two years we're looking at, it's 50000 for both books and it's 50000 both years for taxes. Now, that's a pretty unrealistic assumption because there's a lot of other things that can cause taxable income to be different from pre-tax income. But we're just going to focus on a limited number of items here to illustrate these kinds of different differences. The first type of different difference is a permanent difference. So let's say the company has municipal bond interest revenue. That interest revenue goes on the financial statements, it goes on the books as $1,000 of, of revenue in 2011 and 2012. For the tax return, municipal bond interest revenue is tax exempt. It doesn't count, so it doesn't go on the tax return at all. This is going to create a permanent difference. A permanent difference would be revenues that are never included in taxable income, or they could be expenses that are never deductible for tax purposes keyword here is never. So it shows up on the books, but it never shows up on the tax return. So in addition to interest on tax-exempt municipal bonds, other examples would be tax penalties and tax credits, or state and foreign taxes that are above and beyond what you get from your federal taxes. These never reverse over time, and they're going to cause the effective tax rate to not equal the statutory tax rate. What do you mean by reversing over time? And what are these two different tax rates again? Why isn't there just one tax rate? By do not reverse over time, what I mean is that this interest revenue that's on the books will never, ever, ever appear on the tax return. And this will be clear when we talk about temporary differences in a second, because under temporary differences, you'd have a situation where revenue would be on the books now, and then the same revenue would show up on the tax return later. Whereas a permanent difference, you never see that kind of reversal over time. And there really is only one tax rate. There's the statutory tax rate. This effective tax rate is something that we calculate from financial statement numbers. It's, it's almost like a ratio. And what it does is it measures how much the firm's taxes are susceptible to these permanent differences, how much they increased or decreased their tax rate away from the statutory rate. We'll talk more about the effective tax rate later in the video. Next part of the example is going to show you how temporary differences work. So here, a classic example would be depreciation. So let's say we have an asset which we're only going to have for two years. And on the financial statements or the books, we depreciate it straight line over those two years. So depreciation is 10000 expense per year. On the tax return, we do accelerated depreciation, which means we take more depreciation in 2011 early on than we do later. So we have 15000 expense in the first year, 5000 expense in the second year, but the total is still $20,000 of depreciation expense over the two years for both methods. This is an example of a temporary difference. That's where a revenue or expense is recognized in a different period for tax purposes than for financial reporting purposes. And see, for tax purposes, we basically have shifted $5,000 of expense from 2012 to 2011 compared to what we do on the books. So in addition to depreciation, Bad debt expense is going to be an example of this, unearned revenue. In fact, there's a lot more examples, and we'll see them later in the week. These differences are going to reverse over time, and we're going to store up these differences in something called deferred tax assets and deferred tax liabilities, which we're going to talk about later in the week. Temporary differences reverse over time. So if I have absolutely no idea what you are talking about now, will that reverse by the end of the video? Yes, that's exactly how a temporary difference would work. If you have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about now, then by the end of the video, you will know more than me and actually be able to teach the class. 
Although if this is a permanent difference, then we have a problem. Next, we're going to look at the differences between pre-tax income and taxable income. So we've got EBITDA, we've got our muni interest revenue, we've got our depreciation. That's all that we're going to have for this example. On our financial statements or books, we have pre-tax income. Those are the earnings before taxes under gap rules. And as you can see, it's 41000 each year, 50000 plus 1000 minus 10000 On our tax return, we calculate something called taxable income. These are earnings before taxes under tax rules. And you can see the numbers are different, 35000 in 2011, 45000 in 2012, because the tax return, we didn't have the municipal bond interest revenue, and of course, the depreciation was different. So what that means is the differences between pre-tax income on the books and taxable income on our tax return arise from both these permanent differences, like muni interest revenue, and these temporary differences, like depreciation. Once we have taxable income, we can calculate income tax payable, which is the money that we owe the government in taxes. So we take taxable income times the statutory tax rate. When we say the statutory tax rate, that's the tax rate set by the government. So whatever the government dictates, the tax rate is for corporations. So in the U.S. right now, the tax rate for corporations is 35%. So if this was a U.S. company, you would take taxable income times the statutory rate to get income taxes payable. These are the taxes that you owe to the government. Why is this income tax payable and not income tax paid? Where do we show the cash taxes that we pay the government? I use income tax payable instead of cash as the credit because usually when you're doing these kind of tax calculations for your books, you haven't filled out the tax return yet. And so you don't owe the cash today. Instead, you do an income tax payable. Then later on when you do your tax return, then you would debit income tax payable and credit cash to pay off that liability. But the important thing is to view income tax payable as the amount of cash that you will eventually pay to the government in taxes. So this is what we owe the government in our taxes. Now that we've calculated income tax payable on the tax return, how much we owe the government, we're going to move back over to the book side and calculate something called adjusted pre-tax income. Adjusted pre-tax income is what we're going to use to compute income tax expense for financial reporting purposes. And it's simply pre-tax income adjusted for the permanent differences. So we have pre-tax income of 41000 We subtract the municipal bond interest revenue. So we re to remove the permanent difference interest revenue, we subtract it. And we get to adjusted pre-tax income of 40000 which represents just the EBITDA minus the depreciation at this point. Wait a sec, honey. I just noticed something. Y'all see that the difference between adjusted pre-tax income and taxable income is simply the difference in depreciation. I am sure that is just a crazy coincidence, right? No, it's not a coincidence. It's an excellent insight. Once we get to adjusted pre-tax income, once we take out the permanent differences, then the only differences between adjusted pre-tax income and taxable income will be the temporary differences. Now we can calculate income tax expense. Income tax expense, remember, is the number that's going to go on the income statement. It's going to be the adjusted pre-tax income that we calculated last slide times the statutory rate. So it's the same 35% statutory rate as on the tax return. And so we end up with, in this case, of 14000 of income tax expense in both years. Now, this differs from income tax payable. So in 2011, we have 14000 of tax expense, 12250 of tax payable. And in 2012, we have 14000 of income tax expense and 15750 of tax payable. The reason for those differences is due solely to the temporary differences, solely to that difference in depreciation expense that reverses over time. So let me quickly show you how that works. So first, here's the difference between income tax expense and income tax payable. We had an extra $17.50 of expense in 2011, and we had $17.50 less of tax expense in 2012 compared to income tax payable. Now, if we flip up to the depreciation line, we can see that in 2011, we had 5,000 of extra depreciation on the tax return. In 2012, we had 5,000 less depreciation on the tax return. If we take that times 35%, we end up with an 
uh, savings of 1750 in taxes payable in 2011 and extra taxes of 1750 in 2012 which are exactly the same as the difference between income tax expense and income tax payable. So these temporary differences reverse over time. We have more income tax expense than taxes payable in 2011, but then that exactly reverses in 2012 by the end of the depreciable life. Now we'll look at examples later on where we'll look at more than two years and see how these reversals play out over time. Well, I'll be. I am starting to understand this. But, instead of going through all of this fancy hoo-ha, why not just make income tax expense equal to the income tax payable? You know, I'm asked this question all the time. It would be much easier to have income tax expense just equal the taxes that we pay the government, income tax payable. But it would also be much easier if we just had revenue equal to cash collected from customers. You know, and it would also be much easier if we just had cost of goods sold equal to cash paid for inventory. And so you get the point. We do revenues and expenses that are different than the cash paid because of this notion of accrual accounting, trying to reflect this notion of business activities. Did we charge enough for our product or services to cover all the cost of doing business based on business activities? Income tax expense is the same idea. It's the cost of income tax that we've incurred this period by all the activities we've done this period. And we want to recognize that as an expense, even if it's not all paid in cash this period, even if some of that will be paid in cash in the future. So it's the exact same idea of accrual accounting that we've been using for all of the other expenses so far. Now that we have income tax expense calculated, we can go on and look at something called the effective tax rate, which I talked about on the first slide. So the effective tax rate is defined as the income tax expense on the financial statements divided by the pre-tax income on the financial statements. So in this case, it's 14,000 of income tax expense divided by 41,000 of pre-tax income gives you 34.1%. Now notice that does not equal the statutory rate of 35% because of the permanent differences. So that municipal bond interest revenue causes the effective tax rate to not be the same as the statutory rate. It, it reduces it from 35% to 34.1%, and that's never going to reverse. So this reflects all the permanent differences. So going back to what we talked about earlier, permanent differences cause this effective tax rate, the income tax expense divided by pre-tax income, cause that effective tax rate to not equal that statutory rate of 35%. Last week, we had the effective interest method. Now, we have the effective tax rate. Is there an ineffective interest method and an ineffective tax rate? No, there is no ineffective interest method or ineffective tax rate. Although sometimes on student homeworks, you do see pretty ineffective answers. But, but what we're talking about here is not ineffective and ineffective. We mean effective in the sense of in effect at the time. So the effective tax rate is the tax rate that was in effect during the year which we define as the income tax expense divided by the pre-tax income. If we need to do tax calculations, like compute after tax interest for ROA, should we use the effective tax rate or the statutory tax rate? No, don't use the effective rate for tax calculations. This is a thing that I think a lot of people do, and I, and I totally think it's wrong, because this effective rate reflects the impact of this municipal bond interest revenue. If you were then going to apply that to some other kind of transaction, it's not the right rate to use. You always want to use the statutory rate in tax calculations. Always, always, always. Always use the statutory rate in tax calculations. Don't use the effective rate because the effective rate is messed up by these permanent differences, which don't necessarily apply to other things that you're looking at. Did I make that clear? Okay, I'm just going to wrap this video up with a quick overview summary slide of how all this stuff works. So pre-tax income on the financial statements on the books, if you take out the permanent differences, you get adjusted pre-tax income. If you take that adjusted pre-tax income times the statutory rate, you get the income tax expense. So in 2011, 41,000 pre-tax income, subtract the 1,000 of permanent differences to get 40,000 of adjusted pre-tax income 
times 35% gives you 14,000 of income tax expense. Then if we take the adjusted pre-tax income and adjust for temporary differences, we get taxable income. Taxable income times the statutory rate gives you the income tax payable. So again, in 2011, 40,000 of adjusted uh, pre-tax income minus the $5,000 difference in uh, extra depreciation gives us taxable income of 35,000 times 35% gives us the income tax payable of 12,250. And then if you did the same calculation for 2012, the only thing that changes is the temporary difference. The permanent difference, of course, doesn't change. And the temporary difference reverses so that now we add back 5,000 depreciation expense to get taxable income. And as a result, our income tax payable goes up to 15,750. So I hope these examples have helped you get down some of the terminology that we deal with when we talk about taxes and financial reporting. What we're going to do in the next couple of videos is dive more deeply into how these temporary differences work and how we end up with these deferred tax assets and deferred tax liabilities. I'll see you then. See y'all next video.